Welcome back to Trope Stories, a show about photographers, creatives, dreamers, makers, entrepreneurs, and their personal journeys. I'm Terry Mayday, and on today's show, our collaborators Peter Shea and Tom Mayday. Peter Shea has been a writer, editor, and teacher for over 25 years, and a history geek for far longer. Tom Mayday is a photographer whose assignments take him to every corner of the globe for a variety of commercial and editorial clients. In the Arena, a history of American presidential hopefuls. This beautiful compilation is part history, part photographic, and entirely human. As we learn in this chapter, Hillary Clinton, so confident of victory that she had not prepared a concession speech, was forced to accept the crushing disappointment of political ambitions born half a century earlier, at a time when Americans first began to seriously consider the possibility that a woman could become president. The stories and lessons across the pages of this book are sometimes disappointing while simultaneously inspiring and profound. Let's explore In the Arena. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Peter, you're joining us from Boston. Tom is at Trope HQ in Chicago with us. As creative collaborators, you guys have exchanged, you know, ideas over the years. You know, maybe this idea could become a book. Perhaps this concept could become a book. I have to say you've landed on an incredible collection of stories that feels important and it feels relevant. I'm curious why these stories became so important to you. Well, I think because we grew up in a culture that celebrates um, unquestionable success so much, which is always half the story, and I don't like half the story. But because they are historical figures that are not frequently discussed, this aspect of their lives and their personal stories is often lost, which is why I think it's very important that we took the time to, to collate their stories and bring them forth in this way so that people could understand that essential theme, which is that to engage is, is the important thing. Uh, and I think these people really embody that. And on the back cover, I think there's great context here. This is part of the speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave in 1910. I'm just gonna read this as kind of a nice entryway into our conversation today. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Those inspiring words in the early days of the concept of the book, did it change your path or change the perspective with which you looked at the concept of people that ran for president and lost? It's interesting because the original idea was to revisit these figures that many of whom seem like they were lost to obscurity. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Douglas, the monument in particular that we visited in Chicago, here we were interested in history and it wasn't even on our radar that a very grand, very expensive monument and memorial and tomb was here in Chicago. So it was interesting to see over the course of our project, all of a sudden, memorials and monuments and the names that streets and schools are named after, all of a sudden it became part of the national conversation in a way that we had not anticipated. Which is a good thing, right, Peter? I mean, people are engaged in the conversation. They want to know whose name and who's standing in their communities, right? Exactly, I think it is a healthy development. Um, one of the things that we talk about is how um, the role of monuments in culture was much more significant in, in earlier centuries and then it kind of became eclipsed. Physical monuments were easy to ignore unless you were a, a squirrel or, or a pigeon. But then <laughs> all of a sudden a conversation began about what is the significance of having this object in our middle of our community 
What values does it represent? Does it really speak to who we are today? And it, it ignited a very mm -hmm. lively public conversation, which really um, started in specific regions and then spread nationally. And, and now I'd say internationally. There's a quote on page 15 from the famous author Herman Melville. He who has never failed somewhere, that man cannot be great. Failure is the true test of greatness. I mean, I hear that, and honestly, I feel that way as a dad and as a husband. I, you know, I have four kids. Tom, you have kids. Peter, you have children of your own. Mm -hmm. Do we really want our kids to fail? And I'm just speaking for myself. It's a hard concept to get a hold of. You want them to be resilient. You want them to be strong. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that I can sit here and say I do want them to fail to be able to learn from it. I would say I, I don't want them to fail, but I want them to learn from failure. Failure in many ways is not your enemy. It's a friend with rough manners. Without failure in your mm. life, you're not going to grow. And you see that repeatedly in, in the stories of, of the people we talk about in the book because, as we've said with examples like McClellan, he didn't have enough failure in his life, and, and that led to a much greater failure. I think there are very categories, there are categories of failure. There's growth failure that really, right. in the long run, turns out to be a positive experience. And then there's the failure that is mm -hmm. debilitating and leads to um, um, fear and inability to engage. And so I think we have to keep those two categories in mind when we talk about what types of failure we want to experience in our lives, what we want our kids to experience. I definitely um, am open to the growth failure opportunities um, for my son. Um, the, one that, the, the types of failure that would make him retreat from engaging in life are, are the ones I don't want him to experience. And part of my job as a parent is to get him to recognize between these two varieties and appreciate them for what they are. Business failure is a very, very popular topic, right? How did you fail? How did you overcome it? What were the problems? And how did you manage to get past it? Those are so popular and they're incredible case studies. But failing personally, and by the way, failing personally, but in a very public way, is a less studied group. Just as much as failure in business can be an incubator for greater business success, mm -hmm. failure in politics can be, or some significant failure in life, can be an incubator for political greatness. We, we have retained that idea in business, but we have lost it somewhat in politics. And that's one of the things that we're, I think we were trying to draw attention to. There's something skewed about that, that, that way of looking at failure. Mm. So how should we look at this group of, of men and and one woman. My sense is Peter and I had a vision of and a realization that each one of these individuals ha had some level of greatness and that they were uh, in many cases largely forgotten was uh, disappointing and uh, unfair. So the individuals in this book should not be judged by the singular failure to achieve the presidency. They should be re-examined with the overall arc of their life and political career mm -hmm. and assessed accordingly. I mean, they were this close. And by the way, the presidency to begin with is just the absolute top of the game, right? And you're talking about failure in that arena. Somehow it, it just, there's a disparity between you were, you were this close and now you're just simply right. forgotten. Right either forgotten or remembered for failing. I think that's what we were trying, we are trying to combat the idea that they should be remembered for failing to achieve the presidency. They should be remembered for so many different reasons. The visual part of the book is, is just so well laid out, Tom, and the photographs that you've shot across the country. Most of the time you're working with people and you're working hard to get a portrait, but you're working with someone, which is a collaborative effort. So I, I knew with the photographs, I did not want to show these monuments as they exist in reality right now. Right. I wanted to somehow be able to transport the reader back to the historic period in which these candidates ran. And so we say in the book, a note about the photographs. In an effort to capture the temporal spirit of the monument's photograph for this book, the images were digitally filtered with exposure software to emulate various films and photographic processes. Some of the algorithms we have used replicate the look of callotypes, cyanotypes, daguerreotypes, 
and wet plates using colloidian process on glass negatives. And I think that that allowed us to use modern digital cameras to capture and do the work, but to evoke a different historic period. And each of these required some careful study, sometimes going back a, a number of times. But also telling a different story with angles too, right? So on the next page. It is interesting. I, I found this side angle very flat and kind of uninspiring. Mm -hmm. But Pete actually, in his description of this statue, uh, made a particular comment that made me realize that this, this needed to be seen at a more heroic angle, mm. uh, which showed his expression much better. Did you ever feel that when you were there, did you have a sense of reverence? Did you get a sense of, you know, the power of the man? It, it is interesting because looking back on these photographs, seeing them printed in this book, I have a sense of reverence about them now. When I was there on site, finding the right lens or the right angle, it was a problem to sell. Right, you were working. I was working and I was fairly analytical about it. There were exceptions to that, and that includes Stephen Douglas, mm -hmm. because it was a, uh, it's, it's a tomb for Stephen Douglas and his wife. They're buried there. They're buried there, and I did feel that uh, sense of reverence as I was taking the photographs. Peter, did you feel any sense of, of reverence in a similar way that, that Tom experienced? Did you feel that in the research and the writing part of the book? I would, I would say that respectful um, was, the, was the attitude I took. Um, reverent, it's hard, sometimes hard to write about people when you're reverent of them. Mm. Um, because sometimes you have to take a critical view of, of who they were and what they did. Um, so I would say I, I went in curious um, with a respectful, um, with also a skeptical point of view as well. Um, but at the end of the process, I really, uh, collectively, I saw these, these individuals as just really impressive people um, and, and, and alive in a way that they weren't to me before. And I just, again, the one thing I took away from all of them is just that, that their grit, their ability to stay in the game and to, um, to constantly take on these enormous challenges in spite of the obstacles and in spite of the likelihood in many cases of, of failure. One of the ingredients of greatness that Churchill identified was the ability to go from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And I think many of these people had that quality. I'm looking at Daniel Webster on page 54, mm -hmm. George McClellan on page 94, just really heroic images of men on horses. And th these, were, these were epic ways to depict a very important historical figure. But there's a great quote on page 18. As time passed, however, neoclassical and romantic monuments were replaced by those that were modern and industrial. It became simpler and presumably cheaper to forego civic art and substitute public works in their place. Bronze busts gave way to buildings, mountains to motorways. Reverent remembering was replaced by terse acknowledgement. Civic commemoration was largely a lost art. So not everyone certainly got this commemoration, right? I mean, there's, there's tears. Some people have names on the side of a building. Some people are on the top of a horse in a very heroic way. When did of, this happen? I think of Wendell Wilkie relegated to the side of the New York Public Library. Right. And uh, right. you realize just how far monuments have evolved. Uh, it was an acknowledgment, terse acknowledgment, uh, but not much more than that. Not and a maybe celebration. Not a celebration. And uh, part of it was the individual, of course. But another mm -hmm. piece of it is just the evolution of monuments in general. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, I think Wilkie was the one that really made you realize something's changed because Wilkie may have been a losing candidate, but he was such a dynamic figure, a really uh, feisty. He, he was, in a sense, a Republican version of Harry Truman. And to, to commemorate him with that plaque, I just thought, okay, don't even bother. If that's what you're going to do, nothing would have been better than something like that because you're never going to get a sense of who Wendell Wilkie was by looking at that plaque. And yet there was that sense that we have to do something so that nobody criticizes us for doing nothing. And so you get a plaque on the side of a wall. And I think that really is a signifier of, of a change in the attitude, the decline of, of public art and commemoration that really occurred 
uh, sometime in the, net, in the 20th century. Let's jump into the book, guys. All right. Peter, can you tell us the story of how you secured Michael Dukakis to write the foreword? Michael Dukakis has been a, um, a college professor um, in, in Boston for at least as long as he was an active politician. That was his second act. And a friend of mine had taught with him at Northeastern and um, had given me his email and did an introduction. So I, I did an email and I was waiting to hear a response when about a week later I'm traveling on the Boston subway with my son and I'm sitting there and I'm looking across and I'm thinking, no, it's, and I realize it's Michael Dukakis. <laughs> And so I'm thinking yeah. to myself, okay, I'm trying to get him for this book project. I've sent him an email. He hasn't responded. But I'm, I'm naturally not the kind of person who's kind of like gets people's attention in public. So I'm really struggling. And God bless um, Michael Tukas' wife, Kitty. She looks across at me. And this is a lifetime of being a political wife and says, Mike, I think this guy wants to talk to you. Um, and that's kind of she opened the door for you that's great she opened the door god love her she just said she was very straightforward and i i said governor i'm peter shea i'm a friend of and i mentioned my colleague jim grenier he said, yeah, yeah i know jim i sent you you know i said i'm trying to recruit you for the book oh yeah just follow it up i have an assistant just follow up we'll talk next week and and that was it and that was like i was like wow that was easy we need more chance encounters on the train i think look look what it did for you this time i did it did Tom, there's a great photograph of Dukakis on page eight. Well done. Back to shooting and capturing great yes. portraits of people and capturing yes. his personality. Peter, I understand that you happen to capture a behind the scenes photo of Michael Dukakis standing with Tom just to kind of commemorate the day and say thank you very much. Well, I should say that I captured a nice picture of Peter with Governor Dukakis first. And then I think Peter asked, Tom, would you like a picture with the governor? And I said, of course, Pete. And I handed him my camera. Well, you see, my concept of camera was formed in the age of Kodak. Okay. So in the spirit of collaboration, it just reminded you, you're a great writer. You're a great photographer. Let's both contribute as strongly as we can with the disciplines that we have to make a great exactly. book. But stay in your lane. Yes, Sam. Oh, believe me, I've, I've stayed in my lane. I barely use my, my phone camera now. I, I was so traumatized by the experience. Um, Pete, so. I'm going to stick with my camera. No more writing. <laughs> Guys, on page 43, let's look at John C. Calhoun, who certainly became newsworthy in 2017, more than 150 yeah. years after his death. Calhoun... Um, is one of the is, is unquestionably one of the great figures of the first fifty or sixty years of the country. I mean, he mm. was a major political force, um, and, and he was the chief representative of the South before the Civil War. And he started out his career as an ardent American nationalist, but towards the latter part became more of a regionalist. And he studied at Yale, and it was at Yale that he learned about the theory of succession, which again at the time was something of an academic consideration. Um, largely um, restrained to New Englanders who kept thinking, why are we linking our economy to all these more sluggish economies mm -hmm. in the South and the West? But later in life, Calhoun was really concerned, as were other Southerners, that the, the, the South was becoming a, a subordinate region. And he also had, a, had, a, he had unapologetic attitudes about um, slavery, whereas many um, Southerners and many Americans saw it as a necessary evil for the economy, Calhoun said, no, it's, he would, said, no, it's not an evil. It's absolutely necessary. Every great civilization, every classical civilization going back to Greece and Rome, everything that we wish to emulate had the achieving class, and they had another class that was, that was often uh, in slavery in order to achieve all the basic stuff that the higher achieving people didn't have time for. He said, so let's stop talking about it like it's a bad thing. That aspect of Calhoun's political philosophy was downplayed for decades as people focused more on his positive contributions. And when a college was named after him at, at, at Yale, it was in the 20th century. It wasn't right. a 19th century thing. And then in the past decade, as, as Yale has, has striven to emphasize, as all universities, its, its equal commitment to all diverse community, the, the honoring of Calhoun in such a prominent way became a really major issue. Right. So, in fact, he wasn't forgotten. Quite the opposite. No. He was successfully remembered, which ultimately became his problem. Yes, yes. He wasn't, he was, um, a little obscurity would have helped him. Um, but he was just too important a figure um, to ignore. 
And, uh, and again, mm -hmm. going back to, I mean, we live in an age when we look at people's tweets from 20 years before. Um, Calhoun's public record on certain topics was just so unambiguously right. out of step with the modern age that mm. it, it really it forced the conversation. So, in a strange, perverse sense, his memory was making a positive contribution because uh, you know, repudiating him in this way was seen as a necessary step to right. move forward. On page seventy-five, John C. Fremont, there's a great quote here: "Few individuals have planted their name as firmly on the American landscape." as John Charles Fremont, which makes his status as a forgotten figure all the more poignant. I mean, there's canyons and rivers and streets and cities named after this gentleman. Yet, mm -hmm. if you're not a historian, that is not a name that rings true. Yeah, there's a Fremont in New Hampshire within driving distance of where I'm, I am now. I was half tempted to go drive there and do the interview there. Um, <laughs> Just as a, as, a, as a nod to the poor guy. And again, he uh, was someone who who really captured the imagination of the age. And, and the fact right. that so many places were named after him is a sign is signifies the role he played in the American imagination in his age. His story is a great acknowledgement of, of the precariousness of, of, of trying to commemorate anyone. No, no matter how much you do it, certain things have to be in play for people to actually remember who you are. Right. Page 83, I think this is where at least the photographic journey started, right? Yes. I mean, this was the beginning of kind of the proof of concept for you and Peter. It was. At, at least it not, was. not mm -hmm. strategically and creatively, but photographically. How are we going to transport the reader from a modern picture? It's interesting here, too, because I think that we realized the initial goal was to capture the monuments, each of the monuments, in one picture. And we quickly realized mm -hmm. the benefits of adding additional photographs, additional angles, yes. additional crops in order to tell the full visual story. Because it's cool to see the details, right? Yes. I mean, so on this page, we've got, this is page 84, Peter. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see the entire tomb in context right. with a very small figure on top. So it's interesting looking at this because you have a very grand base. The column itself is 46 feet and the statue, which looks like it has to be a life-size right. statue, is actually nine feet tall. So wow. Peter, you have a sense, this picture, this monument in particular and how it relates to Douglas the person that's an interesting story in itself. I think the Douglas Monument is one of the most interesting monuments that you filmed because I think there is such a wonderful disconnection between the way the monument designers intended us to remember Douglas and the way we, not only do we remember Douglas, but the, the way we read the monument. I mean, mm -hmm. when I first saw the monument, I thought, wow, that's an awful lot of tower to a short guy up to the sky, um, <laughs> which I don't think is what they intended to, but that's, that's how, right. it, because it, whenever you design it, it's like a book. You mean one thing, but someone might interpret it otherwise. And then when I began to weave in his story with Lincoln, to whom he's, he's obviously deeply connected, mm. I couldn't help talking about the relationship, not only between the men, but between the men's monuments. Because the Lincoln Memorial is one of the most famous memorials. It is probably the most famous example right. of political commemoration in the United States, if not the world. If you go back and contrast Douglas's statue with of Abraham Lincoln, if you were to set them side by side, even at nine feet, it would look small right. compared to the Lincoln one. So even then, he doesn't win. I mean, you just can't. Just, <laughs> no. you, and that's and that's. One instance where I really felt sympathy for, I mean, there was a lot of things about, the, um, about Douglas that I didn't like. But when I, I thought about the contrast between him and Lincoln and, and how unpredictable their stories turned out. I mean, no one, no one would have seen, foreseen how these two men's fate and, and their reputation um, changed as much as they did. I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a fascinating contrast. I didn't know you would consider just one definitive photo to tell each person's story because I love the details. So you go through the wide shot, then you come into the detail here, right. which is great to see that the bust is part of the tomb. And then 
this, you have no sense of relation that this is connected to that. How'd you get this shot? This was uh, with a drone, and I really had envisioned this picture, including the lighting, you know, the nice modeling on his right. face. I had planned this shot for several years, and finally had the ability with the right drone, with the right quality, to achieve this picture. And I think it gives a nice compliment to the other pictures to give a full perspective and also to connect it with the city of Chicago and give it some context that this is uh, just a few miles south of downtown Chicago, this uh, largely forgotten uh, monument and tomb to Stephen Douglas. On page 127, we're making our way towards William Jennings Bryan who, like Henry Clay, lost three times. And Tom, this photograph here is in Salem, Illinois, in a quiet little park. But wasn't he originally somewhere else, right? Yes, this particular statue uh, was unveiled on the, National, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Statue was unveiled by Franklin Roosevelt and uh, to much fanfare. What ended up happening is that uh, individuals in his hometown of Salem, Illinois, realized that the statue was unused and in a storage facility in Washington, D.C., and they wanted to bring... Bring him home. Bring him home. <laughs> bring Bill home. And, you know, we talk about Stephen Douglas lonely at the top of right. his pedestal. I get the same forlorn sense of loneliness from William Jennings Bryan uh, in Bryan Park in Salem, Illinois. He is delivering his message in a very forceful and passionate way. Right. And there is nobody listening. And particularly the, the last image from behind just shows a, uh, the, the quiet and fairly desolate scene in the arc of William Jennings Bryan's political career it seems like a fitting, fitting end. The fact that um, um, Brian was statue was removed um, to make way for a new development is is such an American thing to happen. It really is. It's funny in a strange way, but it's that's Americans. We move forward. Um, <laughs> We're just gonna make that assumption. We're gonna move you. We're gonna move you. We're, that, that's the epitaph. Remembered but moved. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At least they're still there, though. But I think the. Really, the thing I love about that story is that someone in Illinois cared enough about his memory to come and get him. As you said, to bring him home. There's, there, he had people who still remembered him and said, okay, you Washington, D.C. hot shots. If you're not going to deal with, with him, we're bringing him home and we're going to give him a park. And I think that's a, a tremendous compliment to the man. I'm sitting here listening to your guys' stories, reading the words combined with the power of the visuals. And I really do get a sense that there's humanity now connected to, you've humanized a lot of these historical figures. Yeah, and I think they're, you know, we're talking more and more about our national narrative. It's time to also include these people as well. Um, rather than hiding them away in a basement, come out and talk about them and hear their stories. Well, we've made it to the end of the book here, guys, only to circle back to the beginning now with a quote from the introduction from James Kelly. At a time when America seems more politically polarized than it has been in decades, it's good to be reminded that people are more complex than we realize, which allows possibilities for agreement and solidarity even across deep ideological divides. So going forward, where are we headed? I think that it says that we're not, we're not at the end. I mean, we, we get into these periods when we don't want to talk to one another. But I think right. that, the, that the people shouldn't lose hope. We've been down these dark alleys before, and we emerge into sunny daylight. As Al Smith said, the Americans never walk with an umbrella. They always walk in internal sunshine. So even when we're contentious, right. there is a possibility of hope and renewal for us. And I think that's really important to remember. I can't wait. Let's stay optimistic. Whether it's running for political office, getting involved with your local government, or volunteering at a local level. Mm. Being engaged 
Being in the arena is a positive thing for all of us. Guys, thank you so much, Peter Shea, Tom Mayday. This has been a pleasure. Congratulations on In the Arena. I'm excited for people to get this in their hands and learn about the stories of all of these great historic figures. Congratulations, guys. Thanks, Thanks very so much, Terry. Until next time, all the best.